on the spot, right? So now you will see in the real life uh, why I bugged you with uh, <laughs> with FFTs. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, Alex. Wow. All right, I'm done. No, once you get once you get the applause, you're done. No. <laughs> so, well, thanks for the invitation. Um, my job here today was to convince you that FFTs are valuable or useful. You know, Alex has said I can only come and talk about Dolby if I talk about FFTs. So I'm going to leave that to the end. Uh, I'm going to start with, uh, I guess, a look at what is audio signal processing and kind of what does Dolby do as audio signal processing? Because while I'm sure many of you recognize the name Dolby, um, kind of breaking down what the actual work in the audio field we do is, is kind of an easy way to pave an introduction to why it's interesting or important to be able to do it well. Uh, and then we'll start with kind of the basics of audio signal processing because um, you, you need this kind of stuff to understand the problems and the kinds of solutions we need to build. And then we're going to take it into a case study and talk about headphone uh, virtualization, which is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, or at least for the last four and a half years, it's been spending a fair bit of my time working on it. But it's also a good example of some of the heavier duty uh, filtering and signal processing that we do, and that in turn gets kind of some of the fundamental benefits out of using things like FFTs to actually do. So that's the general plan for today. I'm very casual. Please interrupt me. Throw me questions halfway through. Don't wait till the end. Uh, we will have a chance at the end, but interrupt. I'd rather keep everyone on the same train moving forward than try and catch you up later. So. Without further ado, what is it that Dolby does when it comes to audio? Most of you probably think of Dolby as a cinema company. It's a bit different to my generation who always knew it as the little <coughs> noise reduction button on their tape deck. But if you've ever seen a tape deck, I'd be surprised. Though I do know at least one person in the audience who probably does know Dolby from being a noise reduction company. But most of what we are thought of these days as being the surround sound guys who bought multi-channel surround sound to such fine movies as Star Wars. And we mean the original ones. So, you know, that was the, the benefit of having a stereo audio channel brought to you by Dolby right back with Empire Strikes Back. So, in fact, Dolby's got this great history where we've been involved with every single Star Wars movie that's ever been in the cinema. So, including launching new technology. So when we think about what does it mean to work with cinema, there's the whole idea of delivering multi-channel formats out to a cinema. So you can play back 5.1 or 7.1. Well, these days, with the newer Dolby Atmos surround sound format, the idea of object immersive formats inside the cinema. So I'm not sure how many of you have been up to the George Street cinemas at the top paid the premium to go and sit in their top class of cinema where you get a Dolby Atmos experience as well as a reclining seat. You know, you get sound coming from above you and all around you. And it's actually a quite a different way of thinking about surround sound in that from a creator's perspective, perspective, the guys who are mixing the audio, they can take an individual sound object, like someone talking or a car explosion, and they can move it anywhere in the cinema. And that's what Atmos gives them in terms of control to play back, which is very different to this 5.1 channel version or 7.1 channel version where they can put it into some of those beds, but they can't pinpoint it. So the whole set of um, technology around being able to author content like that and then play it back into any cinema in the world is a big part of what Dolby does in cinema these days. There's the other part of what you do inside a cinema, and it's kind of same stuff you do once you're doing live music and even home theatre music, which is making the speakers sound good for the space they're in. I mean, I don't know sure how many audio buffs there are in the audience, but the way your speaker sounds is highly dependent on the room you're sitting in. And so making a speaker sound good in a particular space, in a theatre, requires special processing around equalising, making sure that speaker sounds flat making sure that all the speakers in the room come across at the right volume levels relative to each other. And so there's a whole heap of signal processing sitting in what we call the B chain, where we process the audio for the speakers in the space. And 
More recently, we're even moving into actually building amplifiers and high channel count amplifiers so that we can efficiently deliver all these extra channels of audio into the cinema. So Dolby is now designing and shipping amplifiers, you know, a rack mounted 48 channel amplifier so that a cinema can actually run all these speakers they, they want to use these days. So that's all signal processing, that's all the cinema, that's the big screen. We can move along because we also do small screen. We do your TV at home, we call that broadcast or home theatre. Now broadcast is all the live stuff that you get from Channel 9 or Channel 7 or BBC or wherever you're getting your broadcast from. And a lot of the broadcast space involves live sports or serialised content. And serialised content is anything from the nightly news broadcast through to today's episode of Neighbours or Maths or whatever you want to watch. You know, these are all broadcast uh, pieces of content and they're created and mixed from a sound perspective quite differently to the way you mix in cinema. So there's a whole heap of different problems that you have to do in terms of processing them. You've also got the key problem of getting it from wherever it is out to your home or out to your, you know, wherever you're watching your TV. Now, in a cinema, that means running it from a large database across some fibre optic cables to the cinema, you know, a matter of a couple of hundred metres. Now we're talking about running it across half of a, half a nation or even across the globe to get a broadcast, say, from the Olympics through to your home. And so there's a heap of questions about how do you make that data travel? How do we compress it? How do we reconstruct it at the other end? So home theatre, you know, home theatre is when we say, well, at the other end you're getting multi-channel back out. So you've got an AVR with five channels or seven channels of speakers, or you've got an Atmos set up at home with ceiling speakers as well. All of these home theatre pieces need to be able to play back what we send them. So there's a heap of signal processing to get that to happen. And then, of course, since most of you don't own TVs, most of you, most of the population these days consumes their media off a tablet or a mobile phone. There's another layer of signal processing involved there. We've got smaller bandwidths for delivery, we've got different playback environments, it means a lot of you are using headphones rather than the speakers, or if you're using the speakers, you're using speakers which, you know, really probably shouldn't be called speakers, they're more like buzzers, you know. <laughs> they sound that bad compared to what you would have in a home theatre. So, you know, how do we get the best we can out of uh, something like your mobile phone or your tablet? And again, huge number of signal processing problems that, that come into play and things that we spend quite a lot of time doing. I mean, if you've been paying attention to Mobile World Congress or CES, you would have seen that we launched Atmos into the Samsung S9. You know, and Atmos, our cinema surround sound format, you can now listen to out of an S9 phone. So. All the uh, tricks, and trade, tricks of the trade to get it to come out of that's a, a long chain. Now Dolby, as well as doing the entertainment side, and this has all been entertainment style media, we also do business conferencing and voice. You know, how do you have a, a good, clear business to business conference call? Well, I don't know how many of you have been involved in conference calls, but if you've been on technology that's been around for decades, you know it sounds pretty bad. Well, Dolby launched now three years ago, their, their conferencing solution where we bring some of our knowledge around spatial audio back to the conference space. And so there's a heap of this conference work and getting voice calls to sound good. And the reason I bring that up is um, when we talk about the Sydney office, the Sydney office is neatly split where about half of our office is working in this voice telecommunication space, the other half of our office is working in that entertainment and Atmos space. Um, if you've been out looking at other Dolby products like Dolby Cinema or Dolby Vision, not a lot of the Dolby Vision stuff gets done in the Sydney office. We have connections back to San Francisco and Sunnyvale where most of that work happens. So between the Atmos audio story and the business comms story, you've got most of the Sydney office covered in terms of the work we do, plus the super secret new next gen research we do. But anyway, so there's the Dolby what do we do kind of startup that justifies why there's both a, a value to, a market for, and an interest in 
actually doing signal processing for audio. And what do we mean by that? Well, most signal processing for audio can be summed up as take your analog signal, your signal in the real world, bring it into the digital world, and then work on it, do some signal processing before you push it back out and play it over a set of speakers or something. That chain is repeated in pretty much every analog digital audio processing system. We want to dive in and understand a little bit about what are those blocks are and how do we design around those blocks. So, first things first, how many people have heard about the phrase sampling rate? Good, working with at least 50% of the course, great. So sampling is how you go about taking a physical real world signal and start thinking about it in the discrete way you need to in order to do maths on it or processing on it. Big questions around how often do you need to look at that signal in order to get a good representation. And by signal, I'm being super broad here. When I'm talking about audio, we're talking about pressure waves travelling through the atmosphere. But we could just as easily be talking about radio frequency RF transmissions, because we need to sample them if we're going to do something like digital radio. You know, if we want to start taking photos, we're going to be sampling the visible light spectrum. So sampling is a problem that's true to all signal processing. We'll focus on analog, sorry, we'll focus on audio, but we need to answer the question of how often. How often do we need to sample audio so that the resulting piece of data we've got is going to be usable and workable? Now, there's this thing called Nyquist. Nyquist was a guy who was quite a smart mathematician and pretty much put forward this answer of, if we know what the highest frequency of interest we have, so we draw our sinusoid, in order to really accurately sample it, we only need to take two samples per period, which is nice and straightforward. Now, if you look at the diagram, it seems fairly straightforward that that would work for that high frequency. But what he did, and what Nyquist kind of proved, was that that's good enough to do a perfect reconstruction for all of the frequencies within that lower, lower, to, lower below that frequency. Oh, geez, I can't speak today up to that frequency and everything below can be captured if I capture just at that highest sampling rate. And so we talk about the Nyquist rate as being at least twice the highest frequency of interest. The other thing you need to do, once you've decided how often to sample your code, well, how often to sample your signal, is you've got to turn it into a digital number. So if I asked you what your height was, Everyone in the room would be able to tell me how tall they were, give or take. But it's the give or take bit that's interesting. Because none of you would give me your precise height down to the micron or down to the, at down to the atom. Not that that even really exists. We all round it off. You know, maybe you round it off to the nearest centimetre. Maybe you, you like talking in feet and inches and you round it off to the nearest inch. Some of you will be super precise and like to tell me down to the nearest millimetre. But there's a decision being used here to decide what representation you're going to use or how accurate you're going to tell me that piece of information. And that same decision needs to be made when it comes to sampling a signal from the real world in order to work in the digital world. So if I had a single bit to spend on my quantizer, I can either say this sample is a one or a zero, that's going to introduce a certain amount of rounding off noise or quantization noise. We need to be able to answer the question, how many more bits should we spend in order to get enough detail to do good signal processing? So the resolution is what we talk about, a bit resolution. And there's, you know, pretty much this, this chart on the right here shows you if along the right, along the horizontal axis, you're thinking about the analog signal. By the time you give it digital levels, you can see all the error you're introducing in the form of those pink arrows. All right? So that represents our, our quantization noise. And our question is, is, how little noise are we allowed? Or how much noise will we let into our system by sampling? 
Now, if you give me a few more bits, I'm going to start reducing the amount of noise. And there's again a nice little bit of maths that will show you, will tell you that assuming our signal has got a uniform distribution of noise, Every time I add one more bit to the number I use to represent, i.e. every time I double the number of quantization levels, I reduce my noise level by 6 dB. Now, hopefully most of you are familiar or, or comfortable with the idea of about talking about dB as a representation of ratio. Every time I reduce my, D, my noise by 6 dB, I'm halving the amount of noise in there. And that's what we mean. So, if I've got 6 dB better signal to noise ratio every time I add a bit, I can now try and make some decisions about how many bits do I need in total. But that depends on what signal we're going to sample. So let's back, let's jump to that question. What's the signal we're going to sample? Sound, audio specifically. Why are we going to sample it? We're going to sample it because we want to listen back to it. So there's our problem space. We want to sample the audio signals so that when we listen back to them, they still sound good. Now they still, we don't hear all this noise from sampling and all this noise from quantization. So, if we said humans can hear all the frequencies between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz, how would that affect our decision about sampling? Anyone want to have a shot? That's right. Now, in terms of our sampling decision, how would that affect the sampling decision we made? Sorry? Right. Nyquist, this is where Nyquist comes into play. He says, if you only care up to the 20 kilohertz signals, you only need to sample up to 40 kilohertz, twice that rate. So now, we've got this sampling rate question being answered when it comes to audio. If we sample at 40 kilohertz, then 20 kilohertz will still be audible in our signal. So, Snyquist says 40 kilohertz. I'm sure at least one of you out there said, but wait a second, my CD uses 44.1. Because you would have seen that on the WAV file somewhere when you opened it up in an editor. Or if you've been looking at your Blu-ray, you notice that maybe they're being sampled at 48 kilohertz. Now, why are we doing that? Any ideas? So, you can now encode between um, 20 and 22.5 for the CD. What we're saying is you can now encode signals between uh, 20 and 24. That's true. That's, that is the outcome of that decision. But I'm not sure it tells us why. Right, so, excellent answer. Now, can you explain what aliasing is? So you can sample at a certain frequency, but you have parts of the signal which are above half that one frequency, then you can get a certain frequency in your actual sample signal. That's a pretty good answer. Okay, so for those who couldn't quite hear that, uh, the, the explanation was to prevent aliasing. Um, and an explanation of what aliasing is is if you have frequencies present in your signal above the Nyquist point, or above your sampling rate, or by sampling you will still collect information about those frequencies and what will happen is we'll fold the spectrum from those frequencies back in. So there's two things you need to do to prevent aliasing. The first thing you need to do is filter your incoming signal. You need to filter your incoming signal with a low pass filter. So we're going to keep all the frequency content below a certain point. I'm going to throw away all the frequency content above a certain point. So when it comes to audio, we could low pass filter at 20 kilohertz. Keep all the signal up to 20 kilohertz, throw away all the signal above 20 kilohertz. That's called an anti-aliasing filter. Now, I'm not sure how many of you done your signal processing, but if you've heard the phrase brick wall, or if you think about this idea of let everything through, then stop letting anything through at all, that's a 
physical impossibility to build. We can't build something that has a give me everything, then give me nothing with a hard cutoff. We always have this area where we're transitioning between let it all through and let none of it through. And that transition becomes what we call the guard band. So, why do we bother sampling at 44.1 kilohertz? Because we can't build the anti-aliasing filter that throws out 20 kilohertz and below perfectly. So we'll have this guard region around 44 kilohertz. And then, by sampling at 44.1 kilohertz, we'll have avoided aliasing and we'll have had the anti-aliasing filter throw away unnecessary stuff. And the same answer with 48 kilohertz. We're giving ourselves a bit more guard space. Yeah? Uh, that's an excellent question. Is there a reason to sample above 48K or 44.1K? Now, if you put an anti-aliasing filter on and you then sample above that, you're not going to get anything but noise. But are you going to hear that noise? No, you're not. Is there a good reason? Maybe. I'll come back to it in a moment. But yes, people do it. Let's jump to the second half of the question, though. What about bit depth? How many bits per sample do I need? Well, if I told you, and most of you remember grade six science when you were told or introduced to the decibel scale and you were told it was a scale for measuring how loud things were, and you were told things like a jet engine's 110 decibels or 120 decibels, a busy road might be 100 decibels, the threshold of hearing, the quietest sound you can hear is something called zero decibels. And I've skipped the fact that on the back of those dB signals should all be something telling you about the fact you're measuring sound pressure, because we now know that decibels can be used just to express any ratio. But if I said the quietest sound you can hear is zero, and the loudest sound you can hear without hurting yourself is you know, somewhere maybe about 100, 120, DB, how does that help you answer the question of how many bits you need? In a correct, yeah, that's pretty much spot on. In a correctly calibrated system, if you can record the loudest sound and your signal to noise ratio exceeds the threshold, the, the, the range of hearing, the dynamic range of hearing, then you would never be able to hear any noise that was there. So there's a twofold part there, there's part of calibration, but you're spot on in saying that the range needs to be big enough. So does anyone know? Yep? It would depend on how dynamic you want this sound to be. So if you were saying a live concert, you could Yes. So because the way there's that big spike in the drum kit, kind of like gets squashed down and everything gets made louder. Right. So you, you, you're spot on. Everything you've said there is correct. Um, and you're discussing the idea that real world sounds can have large dynamic ranges. You know, you hit a drum, it has a much, much louder peak than the average level. And that louder peak is probably still going to be within these ranges, just with something like a drum. But when I play it back, I may not choose to, rep to, to play back the full dynamic range. Uh, indeed, part of playback processing and part of recording processing is introducing things called compressors. And some of the things compressors do is they reduce the dynamic range so that you don't try to keep the whole dynamic range of the source content. Now, that's, that's great. That's an advanced topic. We're going to skip over it and say, yeah, but first we want to capture it all into the digital space so we can do the compression in the digital space. Because that's the kind of, well, it's one of the tools we use inside of processing. So we do need to capture the full dynamic range if we can. Anyone know how many bits we tend to use? Right, so is there 16 bits do the job? Well, 16 bits only gives me 69, uh, well, 96 dB of signal to noise ratio. Going back to that 60, but you get 60 dB per bit you spend. So 
If I'm only using 6 dB, I'm definitely failing to cover the full range. But that's usually OK anyway. We can get away with it either because we've put some nonlinear stuff in the assumption about what we're doing, or the reality is that, you know, below 20, you know, if I'm playing a loud sound, I won't hear the soft sounds anyway. So having that whole dynamic range present at once isn't necessary. And then you said, yeah, sometimes I use 24 bits. Yeah, absolutely. It gives us an extra, extra chunk of headroom on a signal-to-noise ratio. We've got 144. So, yeah, typically, CDs, 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate, 16 bit. Something like a DVD or a high def DVD might be 48 kilohertz and 24 bits of sam yeah, per sample. And we'll come back to your question. Why would we ever go above that? If this is the limit to what we can hear, why do we hear people promoting high def audio at 196 kilobits per second? Or kilohertz, sorry. Absolutely, good answer. Make some rain for stenography. Yes, sure. We can, yeah, we can use the extra space for some, for, for some data hiding if we want to. Maybe play back at like non real time rate. For, yeah, because we want to play back faster or slower. Yeah. If you get a warm and fuzzy feeling from a placebo effect. Yeah, no, nah, not one I like to subscribe to, but you're probably right. <laughs> Weird and distorted. Yes, absolutely. All of these answers are true because they're all about, except maybe the warm and fuzzy, uh, all of these are true because it's about the idea that just because I've sampled something, that doesn't mean I've finished doing work on it. I'm going to now do signal processing. And to do that signal processing, maybe it's slowing it down, speeding up, maybe it's adjusting dynamic range. Maybe it's mixing uh, recordings that have come from two different pieces of equipment that have got different you know, calibration points. All of those mixing and reprocessing, if I've got extra sampling space or extra headroom in my bit representation, it gives me a better opportunity to do a professional high quality job. Now, once I've finished doing all that work, yes, compress it down to 16 bits and 48 kilohertz and deliver it like that. In fact, we'll compress it even further. Once we're actually going to listen to it, we can get rid of all that oversampling. It's not, you're not going to hear it. Other than getting warm and fuzzies from, from a salesperson, you, you're really not going to hear it. What you have done is given your, your mixing engineer, the people who are working on it to create the final mix, some space to work with. So, where does that get us? Well, we can now do a bandwidth kind of analysis about audio. It's always good to understand what data rates we're talking about and how big. So 48 kilohertz sampling rate, 16 bits per sample, means I've got a basic 680 kilobits per second per channel audio stream. All right? That's where our data rate begins. Now, of course, we're into multi-channel audio at, at, at um, Dolby. We always like to do at least our 5.1s. So, if I had a two-hour movie that had a 5.1 channel soundtrack and I didn't do any kind of compression beyond what I just sampled and took out of the mixing stable, I'm going to end up with, what, 3.9 gigabytes of audio in that movie. And we're not even talking about the pictures yet. This is just the audio part of that track. Um, and in case any of you still own a shiny disc called a DVD, um, Total DVD cap capacity is only 4.7 gigabytes. If I want to put a two-hour movie on that DVD, I'm, I'm only going to give uh, the video side of it about, you know, 0.9 of a gigabyte. That seems fair, doesn't it? 
Since none of you have shiny disks anymore, I figured I needed to do this in terms of you know, your mobile device. You're on 4G, so 4G database, data rates are from 5 to 12 megabits per second, depending on how many bars you've got. Uh, so we're going to send you the uncompressed audio for this 5.1 channel uh, movie. That's going to take 4.6 megabits per second of your bandwidth. And that's still, we haven't put it in any framing, we haven't done any of the actual overhead and transmitting data. That's just the raw payload of the data rate if we don't compress it. Does that seem fair? Well, well, well look, you know, you've got at least 5 megabits, so we're going to leave at least 0.4 there for the, uh, for the video for the pictures. So, this is the justification or the, you know, the reality or around why data compression for audio and for video, you can do the same kind of analysis, is essential. And a big part of audio and video codec work is around making sure you can do this without anyone noticing you're doing this. So, you know, there's the trick of, of audio and video compression. But we're going to assume we can do that. And we're going to talk about the last kind of general bit of knowledge you, you, you probably need to know when it comes to signal processing and audio processing. Um, if you've got the raw samples, we've sampled and quantized the, 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 um, the, or the sound, you end up with literally just a series of numbers. These series of numbers or these samples are uh, usually what we call pulse code modulated or PCM and that's what we call the time domain. So if I was going to draw it, if I was going to put it on a graph somewhere, x-axis would be the time and then the individual values. And you've probably seen waveforms like that before. We can do some useful signal processing in the time domain. Not everything makes a lot of sense though if I treat it as a time domain problem. So this comment I was making earlier about trying to make speakers sound good in a, in a space, and I said we did this equalization. You know, we, we, we might pump up their bass or we might cut off their, you know, their, their treble a little bit. We want to try and end up making them sound flat in a space they're in. That's called filtering or generally addressed with filtering. Um, and that kind of process you think about not in terms of the time series but in terms of the frequency content. So we have this thing called the frequency domain. And you've already been introduced to the frequency domain because that's what the fast Fourier transform does. It takes your time signal and it gives you back the frequency representation of it. So each component is represented in terms of its sinusoidal basis function. Now, there's lots of different things you do with FFTs and that's not necessarily the only way you think about what an FFT does, but that's how we're going to use it. We're going to start thinking about the FFT as the time to frequency transformation. So whether we actually want to go and build our products and do our processing in the time domain or the frequency domain depends a lot on what we're trying to do and the decisions often come down to where is it most efficient to do the work. So I've, if I've got a really short, low order filter, so only a two tap filter or a three tap filter, doing that in the time domain is perfectly doable, quite efficient. In fact, the idea that I do a transform then do that second order filter, then transform it back, it would cost me more to go to the frequency domain. But if I've got a big filter, if I've got a long filter with tap lengths, you know, in the, in the hundreds or thousands, trying to do that in the time domain will cost me a lot because of convolution. What do you mean by tap uh, Sorry, uh, the easiest, well, the quickest way to describe it, if you look at an equation that describes what the filter does, the number of filter coefficients in the polynomial. All right, so if I've only got two coefficients in that polynomial, that's a second, uh, that's a first order filter. So you need one, mil one memory element to hold on to what you need. So where we, where we build these things, the time or the frequency domain, depends on where it's most efficient a lot of the time. And then just kind of as flavor, as well as using the Fourier transform, there's a bunch of other transforms you come across when you start doing signal processing that take you into other domains that are either more frequency-like or more time-like. Yeah. Yep, I've got 15 minutes. Yep. Not doing too bad. 
So, right, so we'll get into the case study. Headphone virtualization, which I don't know whether, does anyone in the room know what that is to start with? And I can just kind of swap spaces. You want to come take this, please? Oh, no, okay. Um, what is headphone virtualization? Imagine you've got a home theater or you're sitting in the theater, you're listening to lots of speakers. And that effect of listening to lots of speakers is quite pleasant. Yeah? We like that. Dolby's built their business on the idea that getting you a lot, uh, more than just one speaker or two speakers makes you enjoy the experience more. But if you've got headphones on, you've only got two speakers, one sitting on your left ear, one sitting on your right ear. What we want to do is try and recreate the sitting in the big room effect when you're listening to it over just a pair of headphones. Now that seems fair, because even when I'm sitting in the big room, I'm still only listening through two ears. So I should be able to do this at a kind of basic level This seems reasonable. How do we actually do it though? Well, headphone virtualization, we can break down into two simple things. And when I say simple, I'm lying. Anyway, <laughs> first we're gonna try and make the sound appear to come from a specific direction. And then we're gonna make the sound appear to come from within a big room. All right, so first we've gotta trick you into thinking about what direction it comes from, the second thing we've got to do is trick you into thinking that it came from a big room. Both of these can be achieved with filtering. It's just about building the right filters. So it's, at the end of the day, not too hard to implement. Now, what do we mean by a room sound? And this is the easiest way to describe it. Oh, how do I get volume out of this? <laughs> do I get volume? Sorry? The, it's set to HDMI. Okay. And that's where it was going, so it's not picking up the HDMI audio. Oh, no. That's okay. We will. No, we'll just keep going. All right, so Big Bang Theory explains it. We're going to move on. Oh, yeah. Just, look, I'm, just, I'm as disappointed as you are. Uh, yeah, so instead of getting the fun clip from Big Bang Theory, you're just going to get the equation at the bottom. <laughs> Seem fair? <laughs> all right, so quick question. How many recognise the equation at the bottom? You all should. That's what you've been talking about. You've been talking about this thing called convolution and using Fourier transforms to do convolution. So at the bottom, we're simply saying... So this is just the product of the coefficients of two polynomials. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So, for audio, one of the polynomials is the time domain signal that we've just sampled, x. And we're going to just treat it like a polynomial. The other is h, and h is this filter we keep talking about. All right? So, you just know of it as a, um, as a set of coefficients that come from, quote unquote, somewhere. All right? And then we convolve them. And that's the work that we would do in the time domain. So, so yep. So for our lectures, H is the coefficients of the resulting... Uh, so Y of N are the coefficients of the resulting, uh, of the product polynomial. Yeah. H is the coefficients. One polynomial has samples of the sound as coefficients. The other polynomial has this impulse response of the filter. Right? So what does H look like? We're going to skip X. X we got off a microphone. We sampled it. 
Where did we get H? Well, actually, we did pretty much the same thing somehow. We got these samples that represent the room. So how do you do that? You go into a room, you play a signal you know, you record the result, and then you reverse the convolution process. And what comes out is something we call the impulse response of the room. What does the impulse response of the room usually look like? Well, imagine I've got a speaker sitting in front of me. What I'm really trying to do is say, how do I hear that speaker from a given position? Well, when it plays a sound, the first thing I hear is nothing because it hasn't got to me yet. There's travel time. So right at the front part of this, right at the front part of the impulse front, you see you know, nothing happens for a bit. Then we get what, we've, what I've called the direct path or the first reflection, or the, sorry, the first non-reflection. It's what's being played out eventually gets to my ears. And then after that, I start seeing all the bouncing that's happening off the room. All the reflections and reverberation that happens in the room gets to my ears and it's what this messy little, you know, noise-like signal is that goes on forever. So, how long do I do that for? Well, it depends how big my room is. How long does it take for echoes to die down in different spaces? Depends. If you're in your bathroom, that goes on for a very long time. If you're in your nice carpeted space with heavy curtains, it dies down pretty quickly. But, if we say, just take the first 50 milliseconds of it. We can work out how much work it would take to do the convolution. We're going to calculate 48 kilohertz, 50 milliseconds worth of samples, results in 69 megaflops, or a flops a floating point operation. So that's what your cost is to do the convolution on this signal. If I did it in the time domain. Yes, that's the order n squared algorithm. So, if we calculate that out for a headphone virtualizer and a five channel setup, for each speaker, each channel, I want two filters, one to the left ear, one to the right ear. That's 10 filters in total, a total of 2,400 megacycles per second in our term domain, time domain. Seems a bit rough. So, Instead, let's see what we can do with the Fourier transform. So first thing you do with Fourier transform, you can decide you're going to break up your signal into blocks. And I'm going to do the calculations based on a block size of 2048. So a nice, reasonably, reasonable size power of 2. Now, we know we're in order n log n. So that's our complexity figure. So we have you know, roughly this term here, you know, k times 22528. What's the value of k? It depends on my processor. If I've got a DSP that's got a single cycle Mac, that's one. If I'm using an ARM chip, that's roughly three and a half. So now, if I want to do a Fourier transform of my block, it's going to cost me 78,000, or almost 79,000 cycles. Then, because I've got the frequency response of the room, and I know my frequency response of my filter, I can do a single pass term by term multiplication, uh, a complex multiplication, because we've got complex numbers, not real numbers. And that's where I get a 9,000 or 8,192 operations to actually apply the filter. Then I've got to switch it all the way back to the time domain to get my answer. So it's the same as bringing it in. So reverse the Fourier transform. Do that 23 times a second, because that's how many blocks of 2048 there are in a second. And now I've got four megaflops per filter, down from 96. There's my Fourier transform. All right? My Fourier transform just saved me 92 megaflops per second on this simple process. But of course, we said headphone virtualizers was a two-step process. There were two filters. So I'm going to do that in the time domain. I do one filter, and then I do the next filter. Or maybe I do some pre-convolution. But in the frequency domain, I can just multiply the signals together. And I only have to do the Fourier transform once to go in and then once to come out. So I can do all my processing in the Fourier transform domain before I produce my result. Where do we do this? 
Oh, we've done it in a few places. So Overwatch was the first place where Dolby had a headphone virtualizer for Atmos that we put out. That's now been out for three years, a bit over three years. Um, and with the creator's update to Windows 10, you can now get this headphone virtualizer in Windows itself through the Dolby Access app. So if you want to hear what this sounds like, you can go and grab Dolby Access and play with this headphone virtualizer and listen to what it means to turn this kind of stuff on and off. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of FFTs going on to get this to work. Which is the quick end to the summary and quick introduction to headphone virtualizers. I don't know whether there's many questions. I'm about to take one or two. Um, if you, uh, yes, we can trick you to hear sounds coming from above you, out of play, played out of speakers that are in front of you. Uh, no, it's dependent because uh, the trick you need to play is you need to play from the speakers the sound that your right ear would hear and cancel out the sound that your left ear would hear from the left speaker. So something we call crosstalk cancelling. It's best, in fact, the best answer is to go and grab something like a mobile phone and when you're looking at a mobile phone, you get kind of fixed locations and it works really well. So are people watching the movie at home, would it be able to do it in the uh, We can do it better if it's a single person, but part of what we've been working on is how we increase what we call the sweet spot. So the number of people who get that effect is one of the, one of the big research problems that we work on continuously. Uh, again, one of the hard problems, but what we have when we talk about um, the head reflection, we're incorporating bounces off things like your shoulders and the shape of your pinna. And these are the things you use in the real world to get cues in front of you versus behind you. All right, um, I'm happy to keep chatting afterwards, but I want to hand over for Steve, to Steve quickly so he can tell you about the actual intern opportunities that are coming up. Okay, thanks Mike. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Excellent, okay. Um, I just wanted to talk to you quickly about intern opportunities at Dolby. Uh, first of all, who is interested in doing an internship over the summer period? Oh, that one as well. Uh-huh, that sounds better. Yes? Okay, why are you interested in doing an internship? Yes? Sorry? Because you're an audiophile, absolutely. Well, I'm not even talking about an internship at Dolby. I'm talking about, in general, who's interested in doing an internship over the summer period and why would you do one? Yes? To learn. To learn. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes? Yeah, to apply what you've learned. Absolutely. Anything else? Um, oh, get some better yeah, grow your skills. Absolutely. Have fun with ha other, have fun with meeting new people. Absolutely. Yeah, and figuring out what it's like to work in a real-world environment as well, uh, out in the industry. Nobody's mentioned money. You're a very altruistic bunch. That's it. I, you know, so, yeah, get some money over the summer so you don't have to work at Mackers. Absolutely. Well, look, Dolby um, offers an opportunity to get all of that and more. Um, it's a practically focused internship over 12 weeks over the summer period, so end of November through to end of February. You come in, you get embedded into one of the teams at Dolby, um, and you'll get to work on a practically focused real-world product um, that is part of a product that goes out into the marketplace in the world, which is great to get that type of experience as an undergraduate. Um, it's very, because it's so practically focused, we do um, give you a mentor when you come on board that will work with you across the entire duration of your internship, and that's going to help you uh, uplift your skills as an engineer and, and produce a meaningful body of work because, because it's real-world stuff that you're working on. Um, the standard has to be high. So hopefully what we want you to have by the end of it is to come out of it a stronger engineer than you went in, have got a bit of experience of understanding what it's like to, to work in, uh, for a software company in the real world, and hopefully enjoy yourself as well and earn a little bit of money. 
Um, what do we look for? Um, we look for uh, predominantly software focused people. So in terms of coding languages, the main languages we use are Dolby are C, C++, Python and MATLAB. Um, we sort of at, we were sort of broken up into two main types of engineers. So people who work as a DSP software engineer, which will probably be relevant to a lot of people in here, um, focusing on um, some signal processing stuff and also the implementation of that, turning that into a piece of software. And then we look also for um, pure software engineers where you don't really need to know much about algorithmic stuff. But what we look for there are people who've got strong um, coding skills, primarily in uh, C++ and Python as well, because we do um, low latency, high performance C++ for um, real-time processing. Uh, applications open uh, at the beginning of next week. Uh, you can just, how you find the links, you can just go to jobs.dolby.com and uh, go search under Australia as a location and anything with intern in the title is something that you can apply for. Um, and they, they close at the end of April as well. So in terms of when we look to do shortlisting and interviews, that happens in May. And then we look to make offers in around the June period as well with people then starting in, uh, in November. Um, international students can apply, so there's no restrictions on that side of things. You don't have to be a permanent resident. Um, and the other thing I'll say about it as well is this is part of the reason why we do this. It's a feeder opportunity for full-time opportunities in Dolby. Um, we have converted a number of our interns to full-time employees, including a number of people in UNSW. We've got a quite a good hit rate there. We've got a kind of a little bit of a UNSW mafia happening inside Dolby that's kind of taking over from the inside. I'm starting to get a little bit concerned about it. Um, but look, that's very, very high overview on that. I know we've sort of run out of time as well. Um, I'm happy to take a, qu a couple of questions now, and I'm happy to uh, go outside after the lecture and talk in more detail what anybody is interested. I've got information on the Dolby internship. I've got some flyers down here with some information on it, and a little bit of uh, a USB stick, just a little bit of Dolby swag. I don't know if anybody uses USB sticks anymore, if everything's in the cloud, but if you, if you think you're gonna use a USB stick, go and grab one as well. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Of project, uh, look, it's very dependent on which team you get in. So you could do some tools development. Uh, you can play around with an algorithm that we've been working on. It's quite broad. So um, yeah, it's pretty broad. Anything else? All right. Well, look, I'm available to talk after.